NATO troops have begun deploying in Lithuania near Russia's border. The first of the four new battalions under the banner of the Western Military Alliance has arrived in the Baltic state. The NATO forces are mostly from Germany and they are part of a 1,000 strong contingent that is going to be deployed in Lithuania near the region of Kaliningrad in Russia. NATO will also have a Navy base and long-range missiles in the area. Lithuanian President Dalia Grubauskaite said that uh, deployment sends a clear message that the alliance will stand united in the Baltic region. She added that the move is in response to Russia's actions. Never before has Lithuania hosted allied military forces of such size and integrity. It sends a very clear and important message to all. NATO stands strong and united. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered an inspection of the Air Force's readiness for combat. Defense Minister Sergei Shuigo says the inspection will review the combat alertness and wartime air defense systems. Russian military forces are put on high alert once every couple of months. The Defense Ministry posted a video on its YouTube page on Monday showing jets firing rockets during a training session in the Lipetsk region. Following an upsurge in violence in the country last week, Ukraine was back on the agenda at this meeting of EU foreign ministers in Brussels. The EU insists Russia illegally annexed Crimea in 2014 and has been arming anti-government forces in eastern Ukraine ever since. The ministers say EU sanctions against Russia will remain in place until the Kremlin honours a peace accord it signed in Minsk back in 2014. Vladimir Putin vehemently denies claims made by the EU and the Western-backed Ukraine. Ukrainian government. US President Donald Trump has made it clear he wants better relations between Washington and Moscow. It is a foreign policy position that is irritating the UK's political elite. There is no case for relaxation of the sanctions, uh, every case for keeping up the, the pressure on, on Russia. Newly confirmed Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov are set to meet in the coming days. Ahead of that meeting, Moscow's UN Ambassador Vitaly Cherkin gave an exclusive interview to RT America's Alexei Orshevsky. Uh, first and foremost, we spoke about Ukraine and the escalation of violence there. Uh, Vitaly Cherkin again insisted uh, that this violence could be provoked by Kiev as one of the measures to undermine the potential reset of ties uh, between the United States and Russia. I think that those who are provoking those uh, uh, you know, manifestations of violence in, in uh, eastern Ukraine, and this may be one of their goals, to make sure, because they don't want the relations between Russia and the United States to improve, to make sure that there are additional obstacles for that, for that improvement to happen. And of course, the, the crisis in Ukraine is one of the uh, things uh, which need to be overcome uh, for uh, the potential of uh, Russia-US cooperation really to be uh, fully, uh, fully utilized. Uh, Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea. Whether he's talking about the travel ban, the way that he's targeting Muslims, or whether he's talking about his relationship to Putin and the Kremlin, and knowing that they have hacked our um, DCCC and uh, DNC, and um, knowing that uh, he is responsible for supplying the bombs uh, that killed innocent children and families in um, in. Um, yeah, in Aleppo. And the fact that uh, he is wrapping his arms around Putin uh, while uh, Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea, uh, we cannot continue uh, to have a president who's acting in this manner. It is dangerous to the United States of America. A Fox News alert and a big story here. New satellite images obtained exclusively by Fox News show Iran has been preparing a new missile for launch. Now that missile has been removed from the launch pad, raising new questions about Iran's intent and also the timing here. Hi, Jenna. Well, there's been a flurry of activity on an Iranian launch pad that U.S. officials have been watching closely since Iran launched a ballistic missile from there over a week ago. That missile test took place on January. 29th, prompting an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council. And a day later, the White House issued a strongly worded statement putting Iran on notice. 
Days later, U.S. officials watched as Iran quickly cleaned up the site and prepared another missile on the same launch pad at a site located 140 miles east of Tehran. Now, in a surprising about face, we are learning this morning that new, that new missile has been removed from the launch pad. It's not clear why. This new satellite imagery from February 3rd, obtained ex exclusively by Fox News from ImageSat International and verified by U.S. officials, show Iran placed a Safir missile used to put a satellite into space. The Pentagon is concerned because this missile uses the same components as those needed for an intercontinental ballistic missile. Today, Iran's Supreme Leader issued a new warning to the White House suggesting a response to President Trump this Friday, February 10th, the anniversary of Iran's revolution. It's not clear why, Jenna, Iran moved that missile from the launch pad. It could be a technical problem or perhaps Iran is reacting to the new sanctions put on them by Washington. This morning, central Israel woke up to the testing of Israel's rocket alert system in the Sharon Plain near Tel Aviv. The drill was routine, but it does come after yesterday's attack on the south when a Palestinian rocket rocket launch from the Gaza Strip struck Israel, causing Israeli airstrikes against Hamas terrorist bases in response. Israeli defense officials are reiterating that rocket fire toward civilians will not be tolerated and have confirmed that Air Force jets struck an armed training camp, security compound and an observation post in northern Gaza. Palestinian sources say a 70-year-old male passerby was slightly wounded in the retaliatory shelling. While there has been no immediate claim of responsibility for the Palestinian missile strike on Israel, small armed cells of jihadist Salafi terrorists continue to occasionally shoot rockets at the Jewish state, despite the de facto Hamas ceasefire with Israel since the last conflict in 2014. The Israeli government holds the Islamist rulers of the Strip responsible for whatever happens in the enclave. Now in Syria, regime forces and their allies have gained more ground against Daesh in the city of Al-Bab. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, the regime's latest advances cut off a supply route between Al-Bab and the terror group's strongholds in Raqqa and Deir ez-Zor. The city is now almost entirely surrounded with Turkish army-backed rebels also closing in from the north. Is this the beginning of the end of the Islamic State group? Half of their Iraqi stronghold of Mosul has fallen to the country's army. In Syria, they're now completely besieged in the strategic town of Al-Bab. And US-backed rebels are slowly closing in around their capital, Al-Raqqa. And now, a UN report says they're running out of money. Revenue from illicit oil sales has dropped sharply, down from $500 million in 2015 to $260 million last year. On top of that, the militant group is struggling to recruit fresh fighters. Titan security has made it harder for would-be militants to head to the battlefields of the so-called caliphate in Syria and Iraq. Meanwhile, in an exclusive interview with France 24, the Iraqi Prime Minister has said they are closing in on Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I can tell you, uh, we have uh, killed and eliminated most of his aides. He's almost alone at the moment. He doesn't have many people to trust. He is in isolation. We are monitoring his movement. He is very low profile. His communication with other uh, terrorists is very low. In many uh, times, it is almost non-existent. Although the picture is not quite as rosy as Abadi suggests. UN envoy for Iraq, Yan Kubis, has warned that the upcoming assault for the west of Mosul will be long and difficult. But as the Iraqi army goes street to street in what they have dubbed the Mosul jungle, they remain determined to prove that the days of the Islamic State are numbered. According to Sana, the Syrian state-run news agency, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said President Donald Trump's commitment to fighting terrorism and ISIS is promising. Assad met with a group of Belgium journalists in Damascus on Tuesday. He was asked what he expects from the Trump administration. According to a transcript posted by Sana, Assad said, what we heard as statements by Trump during the campaign and after the campaign is promising regarding the priority of fighting terrorists and mainly ISIS. He added, so I think this is promising. We have to wait. It's still early to expect anything practical. Now, the Syrian president says he will step aside if the people 
will choose another leader in a future election. Uh, if the Syrian people uh, d uh, choose another president, I don't have to choose to, to be to be side. I would be a side. We don't own the country. The, my family doesn't own the country to say that only Assad should be uh, in that position. That's self-evident. The British government is facing a landmark in an attempt to try to stop its weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. The judicial review was instigated by the Campaign Against Arms Trade, an NGO for the abolition of the trade worldwide. Well, look, they've taken the government to court, and that's because Britain is the biggest provider of weapons to Saudi Arabia. The UK's licensed more than three billion pounds worth of weapons to Riyadh in the past two years alone. Just to give you an idea of how much Saudi Arabia buys, Saudi Arabia has more British made warplanes than the UK itself. According to the latest poll that's been carried out here in the UK, some 62%, that's nearly two thirds of the British public, disagree with the British government's policy of arming Saudi Arabia. So the campaign against arms trade has taken the government to court over this. Taiwan seeks to bolster defenses by reviving its aerospace industry. Plans include a $2.2 billion investment in a new fleet of jet trainers for the Taiwan Air Force. 66 new aircraft will be constructed by 2026. Delivery of the first plane is expected by 2020. President Tsai Ing-wen helped launch the initiative on Tuesday, February 7th. Tsai notes the island's jet-making efforts have stagnated over the past three decades. And she says, quote, we do not have another 30 years to waste. The jet trainers will be developed with the assistance of the island's only military jet manufacturer, Aerospace Industrial Development Corp. Tuesday's announcement comes amid rising tensions between Taipei and Beijing, which claims Taiwan as Chinese territory. Taiwan reportedly scrambled military jets and ships last month after China's aircraft carrier led warships through the Taiwan Strait and entered Taiwan's air defense identification zone. This car park outside the Supreme Court compound was the location of the bombing. The suicide bomber appeared to be targeting employees as they left the court after work. When I heard a bang, I rushed toward the Supreme Court's parking lot to find my brother who works there. Thank God my brother survived. However, the blast took place very close to him. Unfortunately, several people were killed and wounded in the area. No group has yet claimed responsibility for the attack, which highlights the worsening security situation in Afghanistan. On Monday, the UN said the number of civilian casualties has reached a new high. The Afghan government controls no more than two-thirds of the country, and they once had the support of active NATO troops. But most foreign troops left at the end of 2014. Anger spilling over into violence. This is the aftermath of the third night of anti-police protests in the Parisian suburb of aulnay sous bois On Thursday, officers were carrying out raids on a housing estate, stopping young people and asking for ID. It was then that a 22-year-old social worker with no criminal record, named only as Theo, was forced to the ground and beaten. It was alleged that he was then sodomized with a police baton. So serious were the injuries to his rectum that he needed major emergency surgery and he remained in hospital. On Monday night, residents took to the streets in anger. At least five cars were torched, two restaurants damaged and 26 people arrested. One officer has been charged with rape and three others with assault. And the investigation into Thursday's incident continues. This was once a middle class neighbourhood close to the city centre. But homeless people now sleep in Commandoro Square. Still, Greeks are doing what they can to help each other. Volunteers say it's hard to believe that even the middle class are looking for food. 23% of Greeks don't have a job, the highest in Europe. This 74-year-old man should be retiring. But since he lost his job as a plumber, his income has dropped from $1,000 a month to 140. Across town, the old commercial street, Petition, has seen better days. There are big discounts, clothes shops and graffiti. People are browsing, but not buying. Harsh austerity measures mean they can't afford to shop. Once again, Greece is facing an economic crisis. The International Monetary Fund says its debt levels are explosive. There's a looming deadline of French and German elections. And in July, Greece has to pay $8 billion in debt. Analysts say 
It's a perfect storm of trouble. The Army Corps of Engineers has notified Congress it will allow the Dakota Access Pipeline to cross under a Missouri River reservoir in North Dakota. This will complete the $3.8 billion project to move North Dakota oil to Illinois. On Tuesday, the Justice Department filed court documents including letters to members of Congress. The pipeline crossing under Lake Oahe may be allowed as early as Wednesday. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe says a pipeline leak would pollute drinking water and has promised to continue legal challenges. There is an intriguing twist in the climate change controversy this evening. It has to do with data said to be manipulated by scientists. And that data was given to then President Obama and other world leaders at a critical moment. The accusations are explosive, that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration intentionally manipulated data to hide a 12-year pause in global warming, and that the flawed study was a major influence in the 2015 Paris Climate Summit, where Western nations agreed to spend billions to reduce fossil fuel use. That, according to John Bates, who recently retired as a lead scientist of NOAA's National Climatic Data Center. His claim took center stage at a House hearing today entitled, Making the EPA Great Again. We have every reason to be skeptical uh, that our scientific community is maintaining its integrity. In an exclusive interview Sunday with the Daily Mail, Noah whistleblower Bates said, quote, they had good data from buoys and they threw it out and corrected it by using the bad data from ships. You never change good data to agree with the bad, but that's what they did so as to make it look as if the sea was warmer. In a blog post, Bates skewered the study's author, Tom Carl, that he, quote, constantly had his thumb on the scale in the documentation, scientific choices, and release of data sets, all to discredit the notion of a global warming hiatus. The CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science today defended the NOAA study and said that Bates' whistleblowing is overblown. All he is doing, quote, is calling out a former colleague for not properly following agency standards. This is not the making of a big scandal. This is an internal dispute yeah. between two factions within an agency. In a statement, Noah said, quote, it stands behind its world-class scientists, but takes the allegations seriously and, quote, will review the matter appropriately. Critics note climate research today is almost entirely funded by the government. A number of scientists have come to me to telling me that uh, where before uh, a certain time period they were receiving government research contracts afterwards after it became clear they didn't agree with the CO2 theory no more contracts residents of the United Arab Emirates were able to go sledding and have snowball fights this weekend despite living in the desert about four inches of snow fell in the eastern emirate of Ras El Khaima on Friday, February 3rd, the high temperature that day was just 23 degrees Fahrenheit, well below normal for this time of year. The mountainous region saw its first snowfall in decades in December 2004, then again in January 2009, when Ras Al Khaimah got up to 8 inches of snow in some areas. At the time, one local told the UAE newspaper, The National, such weather was so rare that people who spoke the local dialect didn't even have the words to describe it. While Ras Al Khaima has seen snow before, it's still extremely uncommon. So when four inches falls, Emiratis head straight to the hills to enjoy it. Tonight, a tornado emergency in the deep south. We had a, a very serious tornado touchdown. There's substantial damage, a lot of property damage across the entire way. This is what it looked like as the storm moved through New Orleans. Security cameras catching the powerful winds peeling the roof right off this building. <laughs> rushing to this area here. Dozens injured. This drone showing the destruction from above. Homes splinter to pieces. Terry Brasley Sr. and his son in their hallway as the tornado tore through. The wind was just throwing, tossing me and my son from side to side. This is the tornado aftermath. This massive wall of wind taking aim at NASA's Mishu assembly facility. In all, four reported tornadoes hammering Louisiana as students sheltered in school hallways. This massive wedge tornado crossing Interstate 55. Storm chasers just yards away, their vehicles shaking. David, this gas station took a direct hit. It really is a miracle that no one here was killed. Tonight, many people here are now homeless and staying in shelters as they now begin to pick up the pieces. The West also has a weather emergency. A storm that dumped snow on Washington State and Oregon has brought flooding to California. Relentless rain turned a mountain into mud, pushing this entire home into the street. It just started moving. John Futcher got out moments before it was too late. 
mud started coming through the kitchen window, and that's when my wife and my son and I uh, ran out of the house with the dog. 39 schools in Marin County were forced to close with rain filling up creeks and spilling into streets. Fire Battalion Chief Brett McTeague. We have a lot of residents um, that are still in their, in their resident, not able to get out right now. The continuous rain has pulled much of Northern California out of the drought, but NASA climatologist Bill Patsert says the rest of the West still has a long way to go. It took us many years, almost decades, to get into this punishing drought. There is no quick fix. It will take us years to decades to be totally out of the drought. Scott, parts of California are still expecting up to seven inches of rain by the end of the week. I am the last vote and I'm going to vote yes. Celebratory cheers from veterans and supporters as their efforts to restore a cross on a military memorial succeeded. The memorial was donated by a Belle Plaine veteran and installed in the city park this past summer. A complaint from a citizen and then threat of a lawsuit from the Freedom From Religion Foundation prompted the city to remove the cross from the display last month. The foundation saying, quote, the memorial sent a message that the government cares only about the death of Christian soldiers and was disdainful of the sacrifices made by non-Christian and non-religious soldiers. But others say it's not a religious statement, and they've even put up crosses in their front yards to show their support for the memorial. In that context, the cross is a grave marker. And so there's no religious purpose to have the cross there. Doug Wardlow, an attorney for Alliance Defending Freedom, is representing the pro-cross contingent. His proposal of a free speech zone within the Memorial Park is what the council approved Monday, even after several members expressed concerns over potential legal ramifications. It ensures that there's no endorsement of religion whatsoever by the city. It sets it up so that we can have something to memorialize our fallen. I'm going to do this until I go home, home to the Lord. But he's not going to take me. He said, you're going to stay. Like a tree.